bold step or betrayal, Spain's socialist prime minister went to Barcelona Monday to announce the conditional pardon of nine prominent Catalan separatists jailed for organizing a banned 2017 independence referendum. With two years left in his mandate, Pedro Sanchez says he sees an opportunity with the promise of dialogue to follow. He's ready to brave public opinion. A recent survey has more than six in ten Spaniards against clemency. Sovereignists denounce it as a sellout. After all, they argue, you can't pardon people who aren't sorry. While at the other end of the spectrum, hardline Catalan separatists dismiss the move as window dressing or a uh, preemptive save, since the European Court of Justice could soon strike down those long prison sentences handed down in Madrid. Remember, it's Catalonia itself that seems irresolvably split between separatists and sovereigntists. Where is the common ground? In a Spain where other regions enjoy varying degrees of autonomy, nearly four years have passed since it all came to a head. So, have conditions changed enough for some kind of breakthrough? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at what many consider to be Pedro Sanchez's gamble. With us, Barcelona Bone attorney and commentator Edward Salsas. Welcome back to the show. Hello. Uh, from Barcelona, Martin Guria, board member of the uh, umbrella movement Societat Civil Catalana. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your invitation. And uh, from Birmingham, Carolyn Gray, lecturer in politics and Spanish at Aston University, the author of Territorial Politics and the Party System in Spain. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Good evening. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation, and you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24Debate. Uh, it's not a full pardon, it's a conditional pardon. Recipients don't have to renounce their ideas, but they are barred from public office and have not been cleared. Brian Quinn has more. Hoping to turn the page on a period of bitter division, the Spanish government on Tuesday issued partial pardons for nine leaders of the Catalonian separatist movement. The Spanish government has made this decision because it's what's best for Catalonia and for Spain, and it's the most compatible with the spirit of friendship and harmony in the Spanish constitution. The nine, including former Catalan Vice President Oriol Junqueras, were convicted on varying counts, including sedition and misuse of public funds, after going through with a banned referendum on Catalan independence in 2017. Sentenced to as long as 13 years, they've now spent three and a half years behind bars. Their jail terms now cleared, they remain barred from holding public office and can be re-imprisoned if they break the law again. The move has been met with opposition from multiple corners of Spanish politics. The country's main conservative opposition party has called it a false solution that undermines the rule of law. Catalan independent supporters, meanwhile, want full pardons that would allow the return of other separatist leaders, like former regional president Carles Puigdemont, who fled the country to avoid prosecution. It's time for amnesty and the right to self-determination. It's time for an agreed referendum, for a solution that generates internal consensus, ensures international endorsement and guarantees essential social cohesion. It's a risky political bet for the prime minister. One recent poll shows 53 percent of Spaniards opposed to the pardons. Sanchez, though, needs Catalonian lawmakers to support his minority coalition government through the next two years. But the move is unlikely to quell the long-running tensions over Catalan independence. Uh, Edward Salsas, why now? Uh, I believe that the... Uh... Why now? Because he needs the support of the Catalan separatists in the Spanish parliament. It's uh, his coalition. He, he has a very fragile coalition and he definitely needs the support, the votes of, uh, of the Catalan parties to approve uh, essential laws in, in the Spanish parliament. Uh, also, we are uh, waiting. I mean, the, the way has been cleared for the European justice to issue uh, decisions on this, on this, uh, on the Spanish sentence that sentenced uh, these uh, Catalan leaders to up to 13 years imprisonment, and uh, it is expected that the European justice will uh, will uh, somehow uh, condemn uh, or at least uh, uh, correct uh, the, the the Spanish decision. And in a way, it's uh, it's it's a way to anticipate uh, something, a future that doesn't look good 
for the position held by the Spanish government up to date with this Catalan crisis. We need to recall that uh, the, the position of the Spanish government has been a firm opposition with uh, no proposals, uh, just uh, put the law, put the people in jail. But you, on this very set, predicted this day would come when Pedro Sanchez would start to uh, extend an olive branch. Yes, I mean, it's, it, because it's the only way. It's uh, politicians uh, need to start doing politics instead of, you know, playing uh, games with the criminal code and with the judges. And, uh, you know, uh, yesterday we had uh, the decision of the European Council uh, condemning the position of Spain. And it's a, it's a very harsh uh, uh, report uh, say claiming that, uh, you know, in Spain it's at the same level of Turkey. Uh, in in this respect, so so uh, you know the Spanish government needs to amend this position. It was uh, it was a position from uh, uh, the former prime minister, so from a different party, etc. But it needs to amend and correct uh, the the strategy that they've been having on up to date because uh, it has proven wrong. No, it has proven that uh, it does not solve the problem. The 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 polls are very clear in Catalonia. They are at the same levels of of uh, you know. Uh, willingness for independence so so this is not solving the problem and we are in a deadlock and uh, somehow in uh, in catalonia uh, public opinion and civil society and it's you know the the, the unions workers uh, the 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 associations of uh, of uh, company uh, of uh, entrepreneurs and companies and even the catholic church is asking for a dialogue and for an agreed uh, referendum, which is something supported by up to 80% of the Catalans. So at one point, uh, 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 it's true that, you know, I've been holding this position for some time. They need to sit down and talk and agree on, on, on some kind of, you know, referendum or consultation so that, so that we can know what Catalans really want with respect of this, uh, of this question. Martin Gurry, you agree this is a good first step? Um, well... First of all, we have to respect the rule of law, right? And Spain is a very consolidated democracy uh, at the highest levels of, in every single index. And this decision came as a, not as a surprise because it was long worn, but I think it was a little bit sudden that it was played with the feel, they played with the feelings of many Catalonians, of the majority of Catalonians that we do not want uh, this independence and that we suffer so much during those days where they broke every single law in the book. So it was very sad. So it comes as a surprise. And, but what can we do? Well, we have to move forward. And we are an organization that our goal is to live in, co in cohesiveness, in peace with our neighbors. And we have to do whatever it takes that, to move forward as Catalonians and, and as Spaniards. To, to make sure we live in a peaceful and progressive society. And so uh, right now, you're, so you're saying they should have stayed in jail. Uh, is that correct? Yes, our organization believes that the indult did not have basis. Uh, they certainly did not agree, or they did not repent on, every, on anything. They keep saying, we will do it again. So in our, um, in our laws, uh, you give an indult when somebody uh, regrets or repents. But, but let me, their, well, hold on, let me ask you about this, Martin, because friends, right? the, the most prominent of those nine uh, separatists, uh, Oriol Junqueras, he says it's not the position of all the separatists, but it's his position, that there should be dialogue now. There should be some kind of negotiation. So isn't that good news? Um, yes, we agreed to dialogue because for many, many years they didn't want to speak with us, right? They went forward as Catalonia was like a unique one, one people, one country, one language, right? And forgetting more than 50% of the population that did not think the same. So they tried, they, it was like a cult, right? Living as a side and discriminating against the, against the people who didn't think like them. And let's remember, they've been holding power, uh, autonomous power for forever for 40 years so yes if they want to talk and, and be progressive and, and reach agreements i would be delighted and i think my organization which i belong would be very happy for that 
All right. Uh, by the way, this, the, 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 the bitter division that uh, seems to have uh, gone on for a long time is not just in Catalonia. Uh, it's national, you might say. Over in Madrid, the morning newspapers this Tuesday displaying the contrast in views on their front pages. El País's headline uh, quoting the prime minister, together we can make a fresh start, while conservative tabloid ABC writes, Sanchez uh, abandons, as in Sanchez, I guess, abandons his values. Uh, let me ask you on this, Carol Caroline Gray, uh, your thoughts on uh, whether or not this can be some kind of turning point. I guess the first point is, uh, is it just so that, as we heard at the outset uh, from Edward, uh, the prime minister can pass his budget? Or does he have an actual game plan now? Well, obviously, parliamentary dynamics are important. And so what Mr. Salsas was ex was explaining about those parliamentary dynamics, that the socialists need the support of the regionally based parties to be able to govern, that is important. But I don't think it's just that. Sectors within the left, within the Spanish left, have wanted for quite a while now to be able to get back to the negotiating table, to build bridges through politics rather than through, through the law. And so I think that it's a potential turning point, but it really depends if they can agree on what they're actually going to sit down and discuss. Because at the moment, both sides are saying, um, so well, certainly the, the Sanchez and, the, and his government and then the, the Catalan president in his uh, speech this afternoon, both sides are saying that, that this could be a starting point for dialogue, but neither side agrees on what that dialogue should be about. Your Catalan pro-independence side wants a full amnesty next and a, a, a referendum that's agreed between both sides, so a legal referendum, whereas your Spanish side, the, the government of Sanchez, what they want is to have negotiations on how to fit Catalonia within in Spain. They don't want a referendum. So really, I think whether or not it's, it, it becomes a turning point will depend very much on if they can actually make steps through negotiation to, to decide what they're going to try and agree on. And do we have any sign that there's been back-channel talk on that uh, uh, d dis dissonance over what to talk about? I don't think so, no. I mean, I do think we also have to remember that there will have been inevitably back-channel ch chat between Esquerra Republicana de Catalonia, that's the Republican left of Catalonia, which is the main party within the Catalan um, government at the moment, and then the socialists in Madrid. There will have been chat going on, but what they talk on amongst themselves is not all that affects, affects matters, because you've got a scenario, say, in Catalonia, where you've now got the Republican left, um, which, which is the main party in the Catalan government, but they're the, even though they're the relatively more moderate of the pro-independence parties, as we might put it, they're under pressure from their partners, pro-independence parties, some of whom are more radical and want to go further, not to give in too soon or to too little. And similarly, on the other side, you know, you've got Sanchez, who, working together with Podemos, they may well want to make certain steps, but they're fully aware that the opposition, the right-wing opposition, is going to be pushing them to be tougher, and they got to think about what Spanish voters want. So even if there have been chats behind the scenes to try and make some steps forward, political pressures, when some of that actually gets out in the open, often th make things far more difficult. All right. February regional elections, by the way, uh, saw a surge of uh, Pedro Sanchez's socialists at the expense of the sovereignist centrists of Suida Danos. Uh, but they did nothing in Catalonia to clear the air when it comes to that great divide uh, between separatists and sovereignists. Here we can show uh, what the current makeup of the regional parliament uh, looks like. Uh, you heard there Caroline Gray uh, talk about the various points of view within various groups within uh, the separatist uh, movement. It always seems to be fractured, Martin Goria. It always seems like whenever we broach this subject, uh, neither side gives an inch. Is there the opportunity to find some common ground this time? Well, I really hope so. I mean, the truth is that we talk a lot about referendums, but we have elections in Catalonia more than in any other region in Europe. Every few, every two, three years, we keep having elections and the results are more or less the same. So forcing uh, by a nationalist uh, 
ideology, which I have to say it's very, it's a, it's a European disease, this nationalism that has led to so many conflicts and wars, forcing the people to have a referendum when there's a clear vote after vote um, results on the composition of the society, of what the society wants, it, it's very conflictive. And now that they have been given the indult, you would think that we could have a more um, normal conversations on how that what we want as a what we want for Catalonia, our strategies for economic growth, social development. But the truth is that we have been for the last year in a decadency, in economic and social decadency. Thousands of companies have fled Catalonia. Uh, there's no economic growth. We're in the middle of a stagnation. So we better start focusing on on what we can do as a society together and agree on some common ground that Edward, is Edward use, Sal useful and, and sorry. Mm -hmm. Edward Salsas, very briefly before we go to the break. Well, I, I totally agree. Catalans have been voting consistently for the past 10 years for uh, separatist governments and for the first time uh, last yeah, February, well, more, more, than count, number of ballots. more than 50% of the votes the were for is, the separatists. In uh, any event, there's, uh, uh, we don't know where the majority sits and that's why we need this referendum. That's why it's it's very necessary to consult the population and f once and for all know what the, the reality is. And I totally agree with uh, Martin. And from that point, let's move forward and let's build a, a, a stronger country. I want to pick up on that point. When we come back, stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 uh, debate and we're uh, looking at uh, what we're calling Pedro Sanchez's gamble, this decision to conditionally pardon nine leading Catalan separatists over that failed 2017 independence bid. Talking about it with uh, Barcelona born attorney and commentator Edward Salsas uh, from the Catalan uh, capital, Martin Guria, board member of the umbrella movement uh, Societat Civil Catalana, and from uh, Birmingham, England, Caroline Gray, lecturer in politics and Spanish at uh, Aston University and the author of Ter Territorial Politics and the Party System uh, in Spain. Uh, the future should matter much more than the past, said Pedro Sanchez in that speech he gave at the Opera House in Barcelona on Monday. He acknowledged that this pardon was unpopular among Spaniards as a whole, but said it was time for a fresh start. With this act, we are taking nine people out of prison, but we are symbolically uniting millions and millions of people for coexistence. Okay, there's the hope. Caroline Gray, just how much of a gamble is it? Well, I think really it's, personally, I think it's a sensible move. I think it was time for something like this to happen, even if it is um, it, within some sectors politically unpopular, there needed to be some sort of a move to start to try to open up a pathway towards negotiation again. But it's not going to be easy. And actually, just before the break, we were talking about changes in parliamentary dynamics within Catalonia, as well as within Spain. And within Catalonia, actually, you know, the, the socialists did increase their support there at the last Catalan regional elections. And they, who, in, in Madrid, I mean, in the Spanish government and the Spanish parliament, they depend on support from your main Catalan pro-independence party that's got the most seats in the Catalan region at the moment. So you would think there could be more negotiation between them going forward to try and find a route forward. But as I was explaining before, there are pressures on both sides pulling them apart because Spanish politics including Catalan politics, has become a lot more polarised in recent years, both due to the Catalan conflict and also the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. Martin Goria, in those February elections, can you tell our viewers why it is that the socialists surged, they got 16 more seats, and there was this big drop in uh, the number of votes for the centrist Suidadanos uh, party, which is a more hardline position on uh, being uh, uh, pro-sovereignty? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. So the Catalonian politics is very, it's different than Spanish politics. Uh, in Catalonia, for example, our group, Societal Civil Catalana, we have from communists to people from the right, right? So we are able to communicate and what united, what gets us united is more than what separates us, no? Uh, what we do in Societal Civil Catalana in Madrid, for example, it would be very difficult because people are more, it's a division more on left on right. In Catalonia, it's a division more on uh, the rule of law and secessionism, correct? And so for somebody to vote Ciudadanos, which is like a center right, center left um, party versus socialist, is not such a such a huge swing. It's a normal uh, decision in the light of the reasoning of the people. It's a swing nonetheless. So be, why? Who could be more reasonable? Why? Why? Say did... it again, please. It's a swing nonetheless. Why did they desert Ciudadanos for the socialists? Because they people perceive that uh, socialists were going to be stronger on on the managing the situation uh, regarding secessionists, you know? and people thought we want to vote the winner. We want to make sure that we have a change of government. Because let's not forget, we have had nationalist governments in Catalonia for 40 years. So there was this perception that maybe this time uh, we would be able to have a fresh new start and you vote whoever is going to win, independently if it's right or left. Uh, a few years ago it was Ciudadanos, now it's a um, socialist party. So it's more about, you agree with that, Edward Salas? It was more about kicking uh, out the incumbents? Uh, than... un unfortunately, I, I don't agree. I think that uh, the, the unionists in Catalonia actually voted for, uh, for uh, socialists instead of Ciudadanos because the strategy of Ciudadanos, which is a right-wing party, is, uh, was a, a strategy of confrontation. It was a bitter speech. And uh, this is something that the Catalan society is fed up with. And, uh, and uh, Catalans and the Catalan society, I believe, and this uh, we will agree on that, that, I believe that it's a, it's a society of agreements. It's a it's a commercial uh, society. So we need to reach agreements, and we are used to reaching agreements. So so uh, in a way, the socialists, uh, while yeah, defending uh, their unionist uh, point of view, might have a more constructive approach on on the problem. The the problem with what you're saying is that from the secessionist uh, side, there has never been any dialogue with mm -hmm. the constitutional side. Mm -hmm. There's only one mission, to be independent. Mm -hmm. No conversation with whoever speaks mm -hmm. Spanish or thinks different than you, mm -hmm. right? There's only I, one mission. And, and that's I, I, be, I believe that in, the, in this very, respect, very, very tired, very in, tired. In, in this respect, I think that, that both sides, uh, uh, you know, have put forward some proposals. Unfortunately, from the unionist side, we, we haven't had a, a clear proposal on what's, what's, what's the, the proposal to move forward. And I think that Caroline was, putting, was, uh, was setting out this idea no? that uh, it's OK to, 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 to organize a, a dialogue, but we need to know what we will discuss about. Uh, just and before the break, Martin Gurria making an important point, which is you have uh, economic doldrums uh, recently uh, all over Spain, but in particular in Catalonia, helping to perhaps to concentrate the mines. Uh, is that where the common ground can come, perhaps? Uh, I, hope so. I hope so. L let me put it to Edward Salsas. Uh, pro pro okay, probably the discussing, I mean, um, there are many, many subjects in which uh, both Catalonia and uh, the central government need to work uh, hand to hand because, uh, you know, Catalonia is the, the, the economic engine of the country. And uh, in a way, this, this deadlock is, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a damage for Catalonia, but it's also a damage for the rest of Spain. I mean, uh, we will all be better if we work together and we have a constructive approach. And, and within the pro-independence camp, there's different views on how to manage that economy because that that big spectrum that uh, that, that Martin was describing, it's also the case inside the pro-independence camp. Of course, there are different views in the in the in the in the independentist uh, side, and they have uh, you know there there are some views that are are advocating for a dialogue, and there are other views that are advocating for a unilateral referendum. And uh, you know that's uh, it's it's a rich. 
uh, camp of ideas in, in both sides. But in a way, you know, some kind of mediation and constructive approach is definitely the way. It's, it's, uh, there has been a lot of, you know, feelings, a lot of uh, bad things were said from both sides. And now I think that it's probably the time now that uh, time has passed. It's probably the time to cool down a little bit and go back to the main problem is how Catalonia and the rest of Spain can work together, whether they can work together, if, if they cannot work together, together well, the how's, best, the, that... how's the best way to split this in a swift and, you know, a peaceful manner that, uh, you know, is, uh, is convenient for everybody, Martin including Gordon, I, I, Europe. Yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, the situation is not about Spain and Catalonia. The situation is about Catalonians themselves, right? Uh, Catalonians that wish to have more rights. For example, we would like to have Spanish in the school. Uh, right now, all public school is Spanish is almost banned. Uh, so we would need to have uh, a lot of conversations to reach out agreements on a society where mm. we can all thrive mm. uh, socially, economically, mm. and, and let's try to be a little bit happy, more happy mm. with all of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's uh, the, uh, the this call for uh, a little bit less uh, stress, especially coming out of a, a pandemic. Uh, everybody could use a little less stress and conflict. Uh, Catalonia, yeah. uh, which has changed since 2017, and so has the rest of Spain. Uh, conservative Isabel Diaz Ayuso storming to re-election uh, in the Madrid region uh, recently. Uh, she's stolen the far right's thunder with her libertarian views on keeping the restaurants and shops open during the pandemic and her blunt defense of uh, what she calls Spanish values. So, uh, Caroline Gray, do you, you talked about it a little bit earlier. Is Spain ripe for more consensus or just becoming ever more polarized? Well, I think, unfortunately, it has become ever more polarized politically. I mean, in the past... Even since the pandemic. Um, Yes. Well, really, it's difficult to say because pr the changes we saw in Spanish politics with increasing polarization were from around 2015 onwards. And just before the pandemic hit in uh, late 2019, early 2020, Spain f formed its first coalition government at national level and not just any old coalition government, a coalition government between the socialists and a new challenger party, Podemos, the, the further, a party further to the left of the socialists. Now, that's the first time since the 1980s that you'd have, that you have any party in power at central government level that's not just the socialists or the conservatives. So Spain was starting um, from a point just when the pandemic hit, a new start in politics, as it were, mm -hmm. um, after several years of polarization, increasing polarization in the aftermath of the financial crisis and with the Catalan territorial crisis, you ended up with that first coalition government falling. And it's important to note that it is a, a further left coalition than, say, if it was just the socialists governing themselves. And whereas in the past you always had either the socialists governing or the conservatives governing, and whichever one governed, if they had a minority government, they would look to the regionally based parties for support. Whereas now you've got, if you've got a left wing government between the socialists and Podemos, they're going to look to regionally based parties for support. Whereas if you end up with a right wing government, say it's the conservatives that win the PP party, they're likely to need support from Vox, um, which is a far right party. So you're parties are being pulled further to the left and the right. And when I'm talking about left and right, bear in mind that in Spain, it's not only in economic terms. Generally in Spain, the right is more in favor of a centralist state, whereas the left is more open to decentralization. So therefore, when we're talking about left and right, we're talking about these different issues, economic and territorial. And this 50-50 split, uh, it's throughout the country? The 50-50 split on the question of independence. No, when, when we were talking about that before, um, I think uh, uh, colleagues here were referring to the split within Catalan society itself. I mean, at Catalan regional elections over, say, the past decade or so, um, or slightly less than that, perhaps, we've seen consistently at Catalan regional elections that around 50% of 
of, of society will vote for pro-independence parties and around 50 percent for for parties against independence sometimes it's slightly more one way than the other um until this year it was always the 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 parties against independence that got slightly over the 50 percent this year we saw the other way around just over the 50 percent to the pro-independence parties this time but it's a very divided society mm -hmm. in terms of, within catalonia mm -hmm. in terms of what they should do uh, what Catalonia's relationship to Spain should be. And then within Spain itself, you have very strong feelings about Catalonia. And I always make the point in the UK that this is quite a contrast to the UK. If you ask most people in England what they think Scotland should do, generally they don't have too strong opinions on it. Nobody was too worried in England about the Scottish having a referendum. Whereas if you ask most Spaniards outside of Catalonia what they think about Catalonia, what the Catalans should do. Most have a very strong opinion about it. So it's something that you have a divided society within Catalonia on, uh, um, over the question of independence. And then you also have very strong feeling within Spain, um, generally against uh, Catalan independence. Martin Guria, uh, we uh, did a poll on the uh, hashtag F24 debate on our uh, YouTube community page. 70% of uh, those who clicked said they think it is a good idea to offer these uh, conditional pardons. Now, I don't, I haven't looked at to see in detail who voted, but uh, uh, there are obviously people who are not Catalans and who've, who've, who've weighed in on this conversation. Uh, so let me ask you this. Uh, what do you think of the optics from outside of Spain on all of this and the way the rest of the world is perceiving this issue. I was in Barcelona on the day of that banned referendum, and to the rest of the world, it looked like it was the Spanish police using a heavy hand. Uh, your, your thoughts on uh, how you explain this to the rest of the world? Um, I, I mean, it's an it's a internal pro problem between Catalonians, you no? Know? Um, and eventually we will figure out how we can do that together, no? But it's a very divided society, so it, it's difficult to, to to live like that, no? When but you, there's some... When you have, of, for instance, of, of, on, of, on this point, when you have, for instance, uh, uh, the former uh, president of the uh, of the region who is uh, now in exile in a suburb of Brussels and making pronouncements on an almost daily basis. Uh, your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, they were uh, ev they committed every every crime and every lawless act under the book, right? Uh, so the society suffered very much about it. Um, so, what what can we do? No? We hope we can mm. we can do mm. we can do better. No? Uh, there's there's a hope of of, for example, a few days ago, uh, the president of Spain came to the middle of the Ramblas of Barcelona to the Liceo, which is the Opera House. Uh, the president of Spain gave a delivered a speech. Many people agree, some, some do, but let's not lose focus that that hasn't happened in, in many, many years. I don't remember the last time that a president of Spain came to Barcelona, came to the heart of the city, to the Liceo, delivered a speech mm -hmm. to 300 uh, civil society leaders, Many agree. Many we were, our president participated. Uh, as a, as a group, we do not agree that indults are a good idea right now, but but we were there listening our president, and and that in itself, it's a drop of hope that things may get better. Edward Salsas. Well, I think that the sad thing thing here is that uh, uh, you know that the unionist and the sovereignist uh, speech has been dominated for a long time for the extreme right in Spain. So, uh, so, so in that case, uh, seeing Pedro Sanchez on the Ramblas does that change the conversation? I I think that it's a good move, and 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 the good move, uh, you know, the extreme right has been telling the Spanish public uh, opinion that uh, there were many illegal and crimes committed, and now we're. we're we're starting to see, you know, the Council of Europe is saying that it was actually not a crime, and we will see the European justice say exactly the same. So, but how much does that? How much does that matter? You heard Martin Goria say well, this is a problem between Catalans. It matters because it's a, it's a half of the people in Catalonia no believe that crimes were committed, no and this it polarizes the the debate. No, While no here we're not talking about, you know. 
uh, crimes or or about you know uh, you know uh, coup d'etats or no, we're talking about a political debate. It's something that it's very normal in other countries. So it was in, an independence declaration. It's an independence. And there's the conviction for using public funds to campaign for it. Well, that that was less than two years imprisonment, which means that they would have not gone to imprisonment. They were sentenced. The, the heavy sentence was for sedition. Sedition, it's a very serious crime. It's, it's more serious than rape. So it, it means that we are putting some people in jail for things that it's not clear that actually happened, actually happened that way. So it's, oh, yeah. it's a way to to flexibilize the, the, the speech, a way to, to, to normalize the situation. And, you know, you, you cannot establish a dialogue while half of the leaders are in prison. You need to, you know, normalize the situation and speak from equal sides and put forward your proposals and have a constructive debate and st stop listening to the extreme right that polarizes this, this uh, debate. It's not just the extreme right. Can can I participate? Go ahead, Martin Goria. So we, my, my, my colleague here, Mr. Salsa, keep talking about extreme right. There's, there's really one extreme right, which is within the secessionist movement that they declare as uh, Spanish-speaking uh, Catalonians as second citizens. Uh, they banned education in Spanish. They break every law just to pursue their own political dreams. Uh, so to me, it's funny when they keep saying the Spanish... Spanish uh, far right. There's a there's yes, there is a far right, and it's within the Catalonian nationalist movement. I just I just want to make that very clear. Caroline Gray. And it's very sad. I would be very yeah. interested to know yeah. what people were referred to in that. Ca Caroline Gray. I think all I would say is, I mean, I think, you know, there are extremes on both sides. And I think, actually, if we look at what happened yesterday when Pedro Sanchez went to, to, to Barcelona to give that speech, really the audience was were his own followers. And you had outside um, and on social media clamouring against it. You had the Spanish far right and, and, and clamouring against that. But you also had, you know, within Barcelona, clamouring outside where he was giving the speech, some of the pro-independence, the more extremes of the pro-independence movement, who, who don't like what's happening either and see Sanchez just as trying to, 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 to win votes for himself and say it's not nearly enough. Um, and so you, you're, you, there are always going to be extremes on both sides. And the question of whether dialogue's going to work is whether the more moderate elements within both sides can find a way forward. And I think, you know, what we've seen and something I was trying to mention before is, you know, within the Spanish central government and within the Catalan government, the parties that dominate are the at the moment are the relatively more moderate elements within the two sides, but they are going to be pulled and polarized by others within both sides. And that's the difficulty that, that both are going to have to find a way to work through. And uh, th th before, of course, the next election uh, cycle, uh, Caroline Gray, on that window of opportunity, we'll leave it there. I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, from Birmingham. I want to thank Martin Guria in Barcelona. Edward Salsas, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.